Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by coronatools.com, the nation's leader in garden and landscaping tools. Listeners of The Organic View can receive 20% off their coronatools.com purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. And don't forget to check out our contest section. On today's show, Tom and I have quite a lot to talk about. Some of the topics we're going to cover include the controversy with habitat improvement, why American NGOs need to take a firmer position, the impact of dicamba drift on Midwestern farms, Bayer's Varroa Gate, and some stories that have been surfacing, or should I say resurfacing, trying to convince people that GMOs are safer. So I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper, Mr. Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June. Well, Tom, the controversy continues with habitat improvement. I think what a lot of people don't understand is the impact of neonicotinoids and the fact that the soil is toxic. If the soil is poisoned by neonicotinoids, any plant tree or shrub that is planted is going to produce food for the bees and other pollinators that's going to be basically poisoned it doesn't make any sense that they keep pushing something that's so obvious to so many. Well, the evidence that we do have indicates that the neonicotinoids are widespread in both the soil and the water and are drawn up by non-target plants in toxic amounts. And, of course, it's in the water. Everything drinks, so that's a major source of poisoning. And the EPA and the USDA have very carefully avoided any assessment of the level of poisoning. What concerns me even more is the well-intentioned organizations, the NGOs and the helpful organizations, that are proposing fairly substantial habitat improvement and yet are doing nothing that I can see to assess the level of poisoning that may or may not be in that habitat. And as you have said, and as I have said for quite some time, we aren't creating habitat. What we're doing is we're creating killing fields that are going to accelerate the losses. I know that Professor Dave Goulson did extensive research on habitat. And the bottom line is is that there are so many organizations that are trying to encourage people to plant more flowers, trees, shrubs, what have you. And what it all boils down to is if the soil is contaminated, if these chemicals are mobile in the groundwater, and if there's any type of contamination whatsoever, it's going to affect not only the bees, but the birds, the bats, all pollinators. Well, this is a massive poisoning of the environment, and we're being conned by the people who are supposed to protect us. This is a huge poisoning of the environment for the lower level life forms. Now, that brings me to our next topic concerning American NGOs. I'm frequently asked about different organizations that are fighting for pollinator protection. And I know, Tom, you've been involved with several lawsuits as well as several different initiatives. Could you share with our listeners a little bit about the perspective that you have, especially coming from someone who is a commercial beekeeper? I was one of four beekeeper plaintiffs in a lawsuit that was filed in March of 2013. And there were a a number of elements to that lawsuit. My primary reason for being involved is because I wanted to draw attention to the fact that clothianidin has never been legally registered. It's never met the requirements of registration. And that fact has gone unchallenged. Well, 
that was dismissed fairly early, as were most of the other things we raised on technicalities because they didn't satisfy certain requirements. And we're left with uh, a decision by the court that the EPA systematically, over a period of about four years, systematically violated federal law in the registration of 59 different neonicotinoid products. And the key word here is systematically. This is about as close as the court can come to accusing the EPA of conscious, long-term violation of the law. And one of the directions of the court was that we have a settlement conference that the litigants sit down and decide how this should be resolved. And I can't discuss the details because this is confidential client privileged information, but what is being proposed are compromises that will, in my view, really accomplish little or nothing. And my concern is that as beekeepers, we'll see nothing as a consequence of this lawsuit that's of benefit to us. There may be some minor ad environmental advantages gained. There may be some minor legal advantages gained. But it's these kinds of compromises, these kinds of baby steps in the right direction, which over the last 50 years have brought us to the point we're at today. And I believe that what we should do is we should refuse to compromise the court found that the EPA had illegally registered 59 neonicotinoid products. Those should be removed from the market immediately, period. Now, the chemical companies and the EPA are going to scream like mad because we're being uncooperative. But I think that's exactly what we should do. We should ask the court to enforce its decision that these products should be removed from the market, and that whole subject could, should be the subject of a public discourse because these chemical companies and the EPA operate best in the dark, and we need to shine some light on this. I think Dr. Jonathan Latham, who you interviewed recently, made a very important point. He was talking about the poison papers, which documented 40 years of criminality on the part of the EPA and the chemical companies. And what Dr. Latham said is that we can no longer expend our energy fighting this battle chemical by chemical. We need to go to the source, which is the fact that the EPA is a carefully crafted, deeply embedded criminal enterprise. And I emphasize the word criminal. I've been criticized for using that word, but that's exactly what this is. This is a criminal enterprise. Uh, uh, Evangelos Valianatos in his book uh, Poison Spring called it the pesticide mafia. And, and that's what it is. And we need to begin to confront that. And the public needs to begin to understand how ill-served they've been, how unprotected they have been, and they need to become outraged and demand changes. Otherwise, nothing is going to change. Well, when you take a look at the poison papers, the whole reason that Dr. Latham and Carol Vinstrom published, I think it's 20,000 documents, was to prove the decades of collusion between industry and regulators over these toxic pesticides and other hazardous chemicals. And the bottom line is, is that that is criminal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not something that people tend to think of as far as committing any type of a crime. But when you're talking about the massive poisoning, when you're talking about the massive poisoning intentional poisoning of the environment and how many people, how many animals, how many species were impacted by that that deliberate poisoning. You're talking well, about a very big problem. 
I think an even bigger problem, and there was an article that came out just recently, and maybe you can link it to this uh, interview. The title was 23 Days in August, and it highlights the medical consequences of these pesticides, neonicotinoids being one of them. And what we're doing is we're sacrificing a whole generation of children to these chemicals. All sorts of medical problems have been generated as a result of these neurotoxins. And that makes the criminal conduct even more of concern. Certainly bugs and bats and butterflies and hummingbirds are legitimate uh, subjects for our attention. But the real reason we fight these pesticide battles is the medical consequences. And we're sacrificing the children to these. And anyone who's listening who has loved ones or children or grandchildren should be deeply concerned because the medical evidence is beginning to emerge and it's very, very concerning. Well, that's why you have industry continuing to spread all sorts of propaganda out there purposely to mislead and confuse the public. I received so many comments, so many emails, so many communications about this very subject. People really are very confused about what's going on. And it's because industry is out there, they have so many people that are on payroll that are putting pieces out there to purposely confuse the public. And the bottom line is, yeah, folks, you have to go to the science. You have to review the scientists. You have to review the science that has been peer-reviewed, independently conducted, and published. And industry will use science that has been conducted by their scientists. But, of course, as Dr. Chris Connolly pointed out uh, several interviews ago, I, I do believe he was on the show either earlier this year or last year, and he talked about this very subject, and he said, point blank, if there's a desirable outcome, any study that industry chooses can produce that result. So that's basically what we're talking about here. And this brings up, actually, another topic, which is in regards to GMOs. It's hard to believe that there are people out there trying to convince the public that GMOs are actually safer because they claim that there are worse things out there, which is just ridiculous. And Tom, you had a really great analogy for that. We were talking about dicamba. Yeah, 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 but you had, you had um, this is in regards to the laws of GMOs, how there are worse chemicals out there, and you were saying that with GMOs, well, you were referring to the beekeepers, and you were saying something about how with the beekeepers, and you gave a really good good example. That was that was I said that uh, the beekeepers are the only victims of a crime that are expected to go to extraordinary lengths so that the crime can continue. And we were talking about dicamba. What beekeepers have been told for fifty years is that they should either cover or move their bees. But there was a bee protection. It was called the bee caution, and it was a part of every chemical label that was dangerous, every chemical that was dangerous to bees. And that was basically, do not apply this product or allow it to drift to blooming crops or weeds if bees are visiting the area to be treated. Now, that covered most of the historic chemicals because they're relatively short-lived. It has little advantage for the neonicotinoids because they will be present for years. They've tried to pass that off as a way to prevent the damage from neonicotinoids, but it's, if at the very least, if I were in charge, I would fire these people for incompetence, notwithstanding the criminality of the whole thing. And we were talking about the dicamba situation where the crops have been now, because Roundup is failing, they are now being engineered to be resistant to 2,4-D 
and dicamba. And if you're a farmer who has a crop that is not genetically engineered and dicamba, dicamba drifts onto your crop, you can suffer substantial damage. Three states are proposing to ban dicamba. Missouri, Tennessee, and Arkansas, and now it's becoming an issue in Iowa. And I would suggest that maybe we should use the... Uh, position that has been taken with the beekeepers, that the farmers should either cover their crops or move them. Of course, that's ridiculous, but that's what the beekeepers have been told. And it's even worse because over the last 15 years, that bee caution has been gutted by administrative de decisions on the part of the EPA until we're at the point today where beekeepers have no protection under the law. The best they could hope for is that an applicator would call them 48 hours before the application is made. And even that is voluntary. The, the applicator doesn't have to do that. And what that accomplishes is to put the monkey on the back of the beekeeper to get out of harm's way. So, as I said, this is the only criminal situation that I'm aware of where the victim of the crime is expected to go to extraordinary lengths so that the crime can continue. Is nobody overseeing the EPA? Does nobody hold them to account for legal conduct? It's a lawless situation that's completely out of control, and I think Dr. Latham makes a very important point. We need to start confronting the criminality, and we need to make that clear to the public. I just find it interesting that there's an Arkansas dicamba task force, and when it comes to neonicotinoids, there's nothing. There's just absolutely nothing. Well, you know, another approach that we could take with dicamba is the approach that was taken with Percy Schmeiser in Canada. He was sued because Roundup-ready uh, crops had shown up in his fields. Well, perhaps we ought to sue these farmers that are being damaged for illegal use of dicamba. <laughs> they're in violation of the rights of the chemical companies because they're killing weeds, notwithstanding that it's killing their crops, too. But they're in violation of the of the chemical company's patent to, to dicamba. It sounds ridiculous, and of course it is, but it's no more ridiculous than the way the beekeepers have been treated for 50 years, and nobody has taken that into account. I'm surprised that if that is the case, as you just suggested, that Monsanto, DuPont, and BASF have not figured out a way to seek some sort of financial compensation for the drift. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they did something like that at some point. But uh, yeah, exactly, Tom. There is really no protection for the beekeepers, which goes back to our previous topic, which is that the American NGOs really need to step up to the plate. They need to be just as aggressive as the chemical industry is. Well, we've been far too compliant. And that's what brought us to the point that we're at now. We've tried to compromise. We've tried to be businesslike. We, in the case of the beekeepers, we have relatively little power. So we have no choice but to try to be cooperative, even where our, our legal rights are being violated right and left. But these compromises have gotten us nowhere. The chemical companies have simply taken advantage of our good nature and for the beekeepers, we're suffering, suffering enormous losses. The last topic is in regards to Bayer's Varroa Gate, which is a new tool that has been geared to fight varroa mites. The primary loss factor, according to the chemical industry now, is the varroa mite. Our friend Graham White from Scotland makes the point that in France, they had varroa for 30 years without any documentation of 
losses from the Varroa mite. The beekeepers could live with it quite successfully. Until in 1998, a metacoprid was introduced and began to be used on sunflowers and a million colonies of bees in France were lost. The evidence is that the chemicals, the neonicotinoids, potentiate the mites, make them more vulnerable to the mites. In other words, the mites are not a problem except in the presence of these pesticides. But the latest ploy by the industry is to try to divert attention away from the damage being caused by the neonics and they've come up with the concept of uh, Varroa bombs. Supposedly, the colonies that aren't being treated and are succumbing to the Varroa are in turn contaminating other colonies. And very significant researchers have taken a look at that and they have said basically nonsense, that the statistics simply aren't there, that that doesn't happen. But as you said earlier in this interview, June, one of the objectives of the chemical companies is to foster confusion and doubt. So the latest... They're doing a great job of that. Oh, they're doing an excellent job of it because they're in control of the, of the media outlets. They're in control of the message. Except for programs like this, you're not hearing what we're saying. And you're not hearing it because the industry, the corporations, in their wisdom, have purchased the major media outlets and they control the message. The major media outlets have become the house organ. And I just want to point out one thing when it comes to varroa mites. Australia does not have them. And we've had Jeffrey Gibbs on numerous times. And he's a very big bee health advocate in Australia and has a very large operation and unfortunately seems to be a, um, a lone crusader when it comes to bringing about awareness in regards to the impact of neonicotinoids. Australia is the last continent without the varroa mite. And the propaganda from the chemical industry is that everything is just fine in Australia, that it's the varroa that is the culprit. But the truth is that they do not have varroa, but they're suffering horrible problems from the neonicotinoids, losses on the same order as the United States and every other country where these chemicals have been employed. Tom, I want to say thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a very interesting discussion. Well, thank you, Joan. You know, I think this is very important, but it's very frustrating. And I would encourage the listeners to be more than listeners. We need the public to become outraged and to pay attention, to educate themselves and become politically active. Otherwise, the future looks very dark. This is poisoning for profit on a massive scale, and it has to be stopped. We're sacrificing our children. We're sacrificing our health, we're sacrificing the health of the environment, and we're sacrificing thousands of species at the lower end of the food chain to this poisoning. It has to end. Folks, if you have any questions, please write to us at questions at theorganicview.com. Also, please connect with us on social media, and if you are a beekeeper and you have sustained losses, please reach out to us and let us know what you've experienced. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>